Like most train enthusiasts, I love watching the rolling stock roll past at incredible speeds, paying attention to its livery and more. But one thing I and probably a lot of you guys have wondered is, how are the trains actually powered? Mainly the difference between the two main systems used currently, third rail and overhead lines. So I'm going to explain it. Third rail is a method of providing electrical power to trains and locomotives using a semi-continuous rigid conductor which is placed either alongside or in between the running rails. So you have the two normal rail tracks which is where the wheels of the train run along and a third rail, hence the name. This is where all the magic takes place. This rail was referred to as the conductor rail. On most systems the conductor rail is placed on the outside of the running rails but some systems have their conductor rail placed in the middle of the running rails also known as the central conductor rail. The train connects to the conductor rail using contact shoes which are placed at the bottom of the train. It is how the power is transferred from the conductor rail to the train, allowing the train to move. There are two ways the contact shoe can connect to the running rails, either by side running or bottom running, also known as under running. As the name suggests, side running is when the contact shoe connects to the side of the rail track and bottom running is when the contact shoe connects to the bottom of the track. A positive of bottom running is that it's less affected by weather conditions such as leaves, ice and snow. It also reduces the chances of being electrocuted. Bottom running is used on the DLR. As it is a live track, insulating covers are used on some parts of the third rail to protect employees that have to work near the live track. Third rail is powered by DC, also known as direct current. Direct current is a form of electrical current that flows consistently in a single direction. It works by a constant flow of electrons from an area of high electron density to an area of low electron density. Like how the power comes from your charger to your dead phone, moving the electrons from point A to point B. Direct current is used in third rail as it is cheaper, lighter and more efficient. Overhead lines, as the name suggests, are overhead electrical lines that transfer their power to the train via pantograph which is located at the top of the train. The names of these electrical systems are quite literal third rail being a third rail on top of the two existing running rails and overhead lines which are literally overhead electrical lines. I like it, it's simple. Overhead lines are a bit more of a complicated setup than third rail. It requires a contact wire and on mainline services a catenary wire and droppers. There is more to it but these are the main parts that transfer the power from the wires to the train. So the contact wire is the main line that has the electrical power in it. And on mainland services, the wire needs to remain horizontal so there's a consistent flow of current from the wire to the train. However, remaining horizontal isn't much of a problem on slow transit systems such as trams and light rail, causing them to only need the one main contact wire. But with mainland services, the speed the train goes at makes it harder for the line to stay horizontal to connect to the pantograph. And this is where the catenary wire and the droppers come into play. The catenary wire runs on top of the contact wire connected at regular intervals using droppers which are vertical wires that drop down. The droppers vary in length to match the distance between the natural dip of the catenary wire and the contact wire. So the addition of the catenary wire allows the contact wire to be stretched out to have a perfect connection with the pantograph on the train. So when the train is moving the pantograph moves along underneath pressing against the contact wire using a carbon strip insert which is on top of the pantograph. However these can get easily worn out of over time so to make the most use out of the carbon insert, the contact wire on straight pieces of track are zigzagged left to right from the centre so that the carbon insert on the pantograph can wear out evenly. On curved pieces of track, the contact wire isn't zigzagged as the curves allow the straight contact wire to cross over the whole length of the carbon insert. This movement is known as the sweep. Overhead lines are broken up into sections to allow maintenance on the overhead lines without turning off the whole system. The transition from section to section is known as section break and is set up so the pantograph is in continuous contact with one wire or the other. So, these two systems are both very different in the way they transfer power, with both being used due to their different use cases, with advantages and disadvantages for both. One advantage of using third rail compared to overhead lines is that it's less visually obstructive. Personally, I don't see the big deal, but some people obviously care about it. Another advantage is that it's cheaper due to the less components needed and less maintenance needed. However, a disadvantage of using third rail is that electrocution can occur if anybody makes contact with the live track. However, this can be prevented by the addition of platform screen doors or placing the conductor rail on the outer side of the track, which is the furthest side from the platform. Insulated cover boards can also be used but are not used on most systems. Third rail that use top contact to connect the contact shoe to the conductor rail are more prone to accumulate snow and ice. De-icing trains are used to release antifreeze or oily fluids onto the conductor rail to stop the accumulation of snow and ice, which would disturb how the trains run. 
There are also gaps in conductor rail, which is seen as a disadvantage of using third rail. As the train could stop in a position where the contact shoes are in gaps, meaning there's no traction power available to the train. This is the definition of when the train is gapped. To get a train out of this predicament, another train must come behind it and push it so that that train can have connection with the conductor rail so that power can be applied to the contact shoe to allow the train to keep moving. A jumper cable can also be used to supply enough power so that at least one contact shoe can get connection with the live rail. This whole situation is usually avoided by having a minimum length of a train that runs on a track with gaps so that if one section of the train is not connected to a conductor rail, at least if it's long enough, another section of the train should still be connected so that the train can continue to run smoothly. An advantage of using overhead lines is that practical third rail operation is capped at 100 miles per hour. This is due to the end ramps on the conductor rail having a practical limitation of the speed due to the mechanical impact of the shoe. Whereas overhead lines don't have a capless low. This is why all high speed trains use overhead lines as their main source of power. This isn't much of a problem within cities as high speeds aren't usually needed. Strong winds cause the wire to swing, making it harder for the train to operate. Whereas third rail doesn't encounter this problem. Overhead lines can however cope with floods as the electrical system is all above ground level. There's also this thing called mixed system, which is where system uses third rail for part of its journey and either overhead lines or diesel for the other part. The reasons why both are used are due to the connections of separately built railways which use different systems to electrify their routes or historical reasons. In the UK, the class 313, 319, 325, 350, 375, 377, 378, 373, 395, 700 and class 717 are all capable to operate on both third rail and overhead lines. Some examples of switching between the two systems is on the Thameslink trains at Farringdon, where on the southern region they use third rail and the northern region use overhead lines. However, the changeover going north, changing from third rail to overhead lines, actually occurs at the station prior at City Thameslink. Another one is on the North London line. It changes power supply at Acton Central, going west using third rail and going east using overhead lines. On the same section of the London Overground, the West London line changes power before joining the North London line in between Shepherd's Bush and Wilsden Junction. Southward being powered by third rail and North being powered by overhead lines. A little additional information for you. There's also this thing called fourth rail. What is fourth rail you may ask? Well, it's an additional rail which returns the current that was released from the third rail. A top contact third rail is placed beside the running rails and the top contact fourth rail is placed in between the running rails. And in the UK, fourth rail is mainly used on the London Underground. Fourth rail is used so that neither running rails is carrying current. This would be a problem if it did on the London Underground, as with third rail, the return current is carried by the earthed running rails, as most of the third rail network is outside. Whereas the London Underground is mostly underground, where the tracks run through iron tunnel linings, which can cause electrolytic damage tunnel arching and affect utility pipes and cables if fourth rail wasn't used. Fourth rail essentially creates an artificial earth point which uses resistors to make sure any stray earth current is kept to manageable levels. To conclude, electric trains in general are more cost effective than using diesel trains as a separate power unit must be carried along with each train compared to electric power trains which uses its energy from a remote power station to the train making either electrical system better than using diesel. Both have their pros and cons, but realistically, the future is overhead lines. So if you're not a fan of the side of the overhead lines, you're gonna have to get used to it because they ain't going anywhere. Just think about how much safer they are. We don't want anybody getting electrocuted by touching the tracks now, do we? But there you go. That's the basics of how electric trains are powered. I hope you learned something new because I sure did. Thanks for watching, Dan. See you in the next one. And you gotta have your salad as well, man. Bro, we can't be moving in 2021 without no salad. Wait, wait, what are you doing without no salad, big man?